Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. It's our last week. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Director of the Environmental Law Center and Associate Dean for Environmental Programs at Vermont Law School. I'm very pleased to have everybody here today. Um, if you want a Vermont CLE credit, this talk is worth one credit, and please keep track for your records. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation today, and you can type questions into the chat anytime during the presentation. Um, so please go ahead and do that so you don't forget and we don't miss anything. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Jeffrey Garber. Professor Garber teaches environmental courses at McGill University and Concordia University in Montreal and coordinates law and governance research for the leadership for the Ecozoic Program formerly the Economics for the Anthropocene Partnership. From 2000 to 2007, Professor Garber was Director of Submission on Enforcement Matters at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, following 13 years of public service with the United States Department of Justice, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and a federal district court judge in Maine. He co-authored Right Relationship, Building a Whole Earth Economy, as well as many articles and book chapters, and his book, Ecological Law and the Planetary Crisis, was released in October 2020. Today, he will present Ecological Law Case Studies, Bringing the Theory Down to Earth. Please join me in welcoming Professor Garber. Well, thank you. Uh so much, Jenny. It's it's great to be here. The hot talks, uh, hot topics lectures this summer have covered some really interesting and timely issues, and it's a real honor and privilege to be part of the hot topics series. I am going to go ahead and share my screen, and here we go. So some of you may know, last year I gave a Hot Topics talk that was a broad overview of the emerging field of ecological law. And so it's exciting uh, to be involved in the development of ecological law with the leadership for the Ecozoic Project, um, the Ecological and Governance Association, which I'm on the, of which I'm on the steering committee, and to be doing that uh, in, in conjunction with some great colleagues, including many at Vermont Law School, which is a real leader in this um, in this emerging field. So last year I mentioned that one of the ways we're developing and refining ecological law and its principles and features is what we're with what we're calling ecological law case studies. And at that point we were just getting started with the case studies project. So this year I want to give you an update on that um, project and on the case studies that are now underway. So I'll start with a brief refresher on ecological law and its key concepts. Um, I think it bears some repetition since it is a fairly new field. Um, and also on the case studies approach, and then I'll turn to a closer look at the case studies. So ecological law uh, can be contrasted with contemporary law, including environmental law. And I'm very explicit about not just saying environmental law for reasons that I hope become clear as I go through this list. Um, and in a number uh, of, of, of important feature areas. So first of all, whereas contemporary law by and large considers humans as separate from nature, ecological law looks at humans as part of nature and there are a lot of implications that flow from that. In terms of the kind of ecological limits um, and enforcement of those that's involved and in contemporary law and in environmental law, there's really a very reductionist and fragmented uh, approach. It's uh, an area of the law that really um, tries to do as little, little as possible, um, although, although there's many, been many gains from environmental law, but a little, little as, as possible without um, interfering with economic growth and other economic um, interests. Whereas ecological law attempts to embed um, law more holistically um, and with a systems-based approach into law uh, overall. It would give primus, primacy to ecological limits over economic concerns 
um, given long-term sustainability um, uh, uh, concerns. Uh, in terms of use of materials and energy, the contemporary legal system basically promotes efficiency in terms of the use of materials and energy with the interest of allowing those to be used continually uh, over time. Um, one uh, aspect of, uh, of this approach is that when, as we get more efficient in using things, by and large, we tend to use more of them. This is called the Jevons paradox or the rebound effect. So ecological law is, would, would put the concept of sufficiency front and center as opposed to efficiency. Um, making do with enough um, and not taking more uh, than we need. So whereas contemporary law really puts a core faith in the decoupling of throughput of the material and energy from the impacts of that throughput, ecological law will call for a drastic reduction um, in throughput, given what we now know is, is, is happening in terms of the ecological impacts of that throughput in order to keep the economy within ecological bounds. In terms of scale, there's a strong commitment in contemporary law or a strong recognition of state sovereignty with weak international and global regimes. Uh, and in ecological law, there would be a much stronger commitment to, to the so called the, what's called the subsidi subsidiarity principle, which means you have strict global regimes for global issues, but only global issues and a respect for local regimes. Um, where that's sufficient to achieve the objective you're trying uh, to achieve. In terms of fairness in contemporary law, we have a real core belief in the fairness of markets uh, with recognition of some need for correction. And this is really the arena in which a lot of environmental operates. We, we do have laws that recognize um, of the polluter pay principles, to recognize the need to um, regulate or do something to make sure that externalities of economic activity are accounted for and dealt with um, and made in some cases to be the cost of doing business. Uh, there's a strong tendency to monetize, which is kind of an imperfect way to, um, uh, to sort out different values, especially when you're dealing with complex ecosystems and global issues. So in ecological law, there's, there will be stronger limits on market mechanisms, a bigger role for non-market decision-making and value judgments and a much stronger commitment to interhuman, interspecies, and intergenerational fairness. Uh, finally, in terms of research monitoring and adaptation, in uh, contemporary law and environmental law, effects on human health are typically paramount. A good example of that is the US Clean Air Act, which is, seems like an environmental law, but a lot of its main objectives are, are, are tied to human health, with environmental effects being secondary in that case. Um, there is, by and large, uh, nominal recognition of a, of, of a precautionary approach, but often it's a very weak precautionary approach. And I'll give you some examples of how that's even turned on its head. Um, and, and there are few adaptive mechanisms to adjust rules based on monitoring. So uh, ecological law would put planetary boundaries and other ecological limits. Uh, uh, as the key basis of research, monitoring, and adaptation. So the idea is to make sure, first and foremost, that we're staying within planetary boundaries of safe operating space for humans using a strong precautionary approach. Ecological law case studies are a way to uh, apply some of these theoretical ideas of ecological law in real world context and, and in concrete settings. So these could be a particular project, they could be a policy approach, they could be a sectoral, sectoral feature like urban infrastructure or transportation infrastructure. And the idea is to take whatever the focus of the study is and to identify all the legal and policy features of the situation that are both an indirect uh, and direct at all governance levels from the local to the global scale then to analyze how those line up with ecological features and then reconstruct the situation uh, and describe the legal and policy features that would apply in a regime of ecological law, again, at all local levels from local to global. Why do we do these? First of all, to help define ecological law. Like I said, it's largely theoretical to, so to give it more meaning, meaning uh, 
by contextualizing it, and also to avoid dilution of its principles. So one, one thing that people working on ecological law are concerned about is that it could be diluted in the same way that sustainable, sustainable development over time has, has, has been diluted. Um, so that there's real questions now whether international understandings of sustainable development really will ensure sustainability. So that's one reason. Another is to show concretely how ecological law transforms all law, not just environmental law. So I said when I'm making the comparison with contemporary, contemporary law and not environmental law, this is a key reason. If you put ecological uh, primacy at the center of law, then it really has to go way beyond what environmental law does. It has to affect all areas of, of the law. Um, it's also to make clear the deep inadequacy of the status quo and the nature of the obstacles to overcome if we are to achieve uh, the vision and promise of ecological uh, law, which I describe most often as being uh, to achieve a mutually enhancing human earth relationship, something that our current economic and legal systems are far from doing. Another reason to do these is to highlight traditional ref transitional reforms in the direction of ecological law. So the fully built vision of ecological law can seem extremely elusive and far off in the future if it's possible um, at all. So um, it's important to, to, to provide that clear vision when we do these case studies, but also to show opportunities more in the short and near term of how we can move in that direction. And here's just a schematic of uh, a summary schematic of, 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 of how these work. So again, deconstruction of the current law, not just environmental law, but also development oriented law, like property law, labor, trade and investment law, corporate law, and so on. And again, from the local to the global level. Then analysis using some tools that I will discuss in a minute, the lens of ecological law and, and lock in lockout assessments are some examples. And then these, this reconstruction. Again, it, a, a transitional uh, description, which may seem more plausible or practical in the near term, and then a longer vision that may seem more elusive at the, uh, for now. Just a review again of some of the key features of ecological law, ecological law, that humans are part of Earth's life systems, that um, ecological boundaries like planetary boundaries need to be given primacy over socioeconomic spheres. There needs to be full integration of ecological limits and rules and policy. And this is a key distinction again with environmental law. A much greater focus given the current state of affairs on reducing material and energy throughput, given what we know about how much that correlates to degradation of our supporting ecosystems, uh, right up to um, key issues like climate change. The use of biocapacity and extracted materials based on real need, not on utilitarian desires. So much of our economy and the law that supports it um, uses market prices, which is really how much we want things and how we're willing to pay. Uh, but that's very much connect, disconnected from these ecological limits that are central to ecological law. A plurality of diverse place-based approaches, but a global uh, uh, scope when necessary. This is one way to talk to, to describe this notion of subsidiarity. Binding and supranational rules were necessary. Um, so typically rules about environmental protection are, are pretty weak at the, at the supranational level. So, um, in ecological law, there would be a much stronger commitment to allowing those rules when they're necessary. Fair sharing among present and future generations of life, again, greatly expanded in different kinds of research and monitoring using precaution about crossing boundaries, boundaries, and also an adaptive approach that allows us to learn from what we're to, 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 to react from what we're learning from research and monitoring, uh, to work continually towards this goal of a mutually enhancing human earth relationship. Um, my friend and colleague, Carlos Spared has reduced these features into three uh, notions, ecocentrism, ecological primacy, and eco ecological uh, justice. So she uses those ideas in her uh, lens of ecological law, which is one of the analytical tools that can be used doing these case studies. And I'll explain that uh, a, a little more in a bit. Lock-in, lock-out assessments are really looking at uh, 
um, obstacles that prevent um, progress towards ecological law uh, in terms of how deeply wired into legal systems or systems that legal systems interacts with. So economic systems, technological systems, um, and, and so on. Um, how, how deeply wired they are and how long we can estimate it would take to overcome them. Um, and also looking at opportunities for um, implementing ecological law principles. Again, looking at how uh, hardwired a system is to keep those opportunities from being undertaken um, and also how long it would take to pursue those opportunities. Um, that's something I developed in my, in my PhD work. Um, uh, and you can use those to develop strategies on, on, on what to prioritize at different points in time. Um, analytical methods using planetary boundaries, ecological footprint, material and energy flow uh, analysis, and so, so, us, so on are also useful here. Those and other methods that are used in the degrowth world or in, in, in donut and ecological economics, I'll explain donut economics in a minute, um, are really important um, because they don't use monetary valuations uh, as a primary metric. Uh, it's more difficult in, in, to, to look at these systems flows and so on from a non-monetary unit in some uh, a sense, but you get much better information and it's much more consistent uh, because whenever you are reducing things to monetary valuation, you are creating uh, problematic estimates. And sometimes those are very, very problematic. Community and stakeholder consultations can be a part of these uh, case studies, interviews with knowledge holders. There's a strong hope uh, uh, that these will be interdisciplinary case studies and not even it's hard to do that when you're calling them ecological law case studies, but um, certainly I um, am committed to an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And then flexibility is key. It's important for study teams to have the freedom to innovate and to tailor this overall methodology to the particular issue that they're looking at. The lens of ecological law is, is probably the most useful and relevant tool here. And so I just wanna ex explain a little what Carla Spert has uh, means by these terms. So e in ecocentrism, she's talking about recognizing and respecting the value of all beings and the interconnectedness among them with equitable uh, uh, pr promotion of the interests of human and non-human members of the earth community. Ecological privacy is, is about ensuring that social and economic behavior and systems are ecologically bound, respecting, respecting planetary boundaries or other relevant ecological limits. And ecological justice is about ensuring equitable access to the Earth's sustaining capacity for present and future generations of humans and other life and avoiding the inequitable allocation of environmental harms. So these principles can be used for looking um, at the legal and policy array that underlies a particular case um, before you then rebuild it um, consistent with ecological law. Carla's book, The Lens of Ecological Law applies her lens into, into some really interesting cases, um, lithium mining in Bolivia, uh, a, 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 a ban on metal mining in El Salvador and mining in Northern Ontario. In my book, Ecological on the Planetary Crisis, per, per, describes in some detail the lock-in, lock-out assessment approach that I, method, uh, that I mentioned. The other um, methodology that I think is really interesting uh, it, is so-called donut economics. This is work developed by Kate Rayworth. And, and so she starts with the planetary boundaries and says, okay, those are ceilings. Those are things that we should not uh, surpass, but we also need to maintain social foundations. So th this reflects to me the idea that I uh, like, you know, I, 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 I've struggled with the terms anthropocentric and ecocentric and, sent, and then sort of decided the one that works for me is, human inclusive ecocentric. We need to, I'm not indifferent to human uh, survival. Um, so her, her notion of, of providing a social foundation in regard to some key areas, food, water, income, education, resilience, voice. Uh, so that's participation and so on. Jobs, energy, social equity, gender, equality, uh, health, and so on. Um, 
her her proposal to try to live within that green donut, the safe and just space for human, humanity, provides a, a, a strong state of and systems based set of integrated uh, ways to think about ecological law. So I, I just want to review some some of the examples I gave you before before I update you on on the five case studies where we've jumped into. I I uh, thought of these examples when I was first proposing these ecological law case studies is the kind of things you could apply uh, this to. So one is this Cartier Distant uh, outside of Montreal, this, which is, is self-described as Canada's first lifestyle center. And what they mean by that is that this would be a commercial uh, lifestyle center located in Brossard, Quebec, of about uh, maybe 10 or 20 kilometers outside of Montreal, designed to emulate an urban or downtown shopping experience with boutiques and to meet the needs of suburban dwellers living on the south shore of Montreal. Um, I suppose that might be appealing to, to, to some people. It, it certainly is not to me. I mean, it puts front and center uh, in, in terms of things like worldview, human earth relationship, or a vision of, of the future, uh, a lifestyle uh, built around shopping, consumerism, global brands, uh, a certain form of labor relations, a certain notions of entertainment, certain notions of community, um, uh, front and center. Um, and, and, and this is also a lifestyle that is very car dependent in that um, this uh, development is at the intersection of two um, highways. Um, it puts into stark relief this difference between true need and not taking more than we need to, to, to live well, to live sufficiently well um, versus utilitarian desires, which are, are, are really pushed uh, uh, um, in, in this particular uh, development. You can contextualize this from the global to the local level. At the local level, you know, the land use regimes here, which would be a piece together aspects of C Canadian, Quebec, and local regional law. Um, uh, the land use is such that uh, farmland has been allowed to be converted, uh, very good farmland for suburban development. And again, this is situated at the intersection of two auto routes. Um, and at the global level, down to the local level, you, you, you can see the connection here between some, some key planetary boundaries, climate change because of the car use and so on. Um, and there are then local biodiversity issues. Um, I, I don't know if there's been issues directly with the Western chorus broad, frog, but this is an endangered species that a lot of suburban development around Montreal um, is, is imperiling. So the second uh, illustration I gave at the beginning was the Kinswood Dam. This is a, a dam um, located in Western New York State. Uh, that was built in the 1960s, um, and you can see uh, the green area in this map is the Seneca uh, Reservation, and the blue area, you can see the expanded blue uh, area there around um, High Banks um, is where the dam uh, was created. So this dam was authorized by Congress in Flood Control Acts in the 1930s to protect Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from floods. So. The Seneca Nation and its allies uh, resisted this project for, for a long time. Um, they got a commitment from President, uh, uh, presidential candidate John Kennedy not to go ahead with it, but Pennsylvania was the state that put him over the top of the Electoral College. Um, and so he reneged on that promise and and they went ahead with domain so condemnation of one third of the seneca reservation uh which was a court sanctioned breach of one of the oldest uh, treaties in the area the treaty of canandaiga uh in which the united states uh a, a promise that they would never claim this land nor disturb the seneca nation nor any of the six nations or of their indian friends residing thereon and united with them in the free use and enjoyment thereof it was a clear breach. Um, part of the story here is the creation and the authority of the Army Corps of Engineers operating under federal law to uh, undertake a project like this. And of course, there were numerous side effects, um, significant displacement of members of the Seneca Nation, 
Um, in addition to flood control protection, there was hydro hydroelectric power production and outdoor recreation. Um, hydro hydro hydropower, again, maybe reducing climate change, but also providing energy that allows other kinds of development that can increase environmental harms. The dam led to a highway being built through the remaining portion of the Seneca Reservation, which required condemning more Seneca land. Uh, this was before the National Environmental Policy, Policy Act, where the, there was no um, EIS. So these side effects weren't fully examined as they would be in, a, in, in, in under current law in the United States. But this example, again, puts in question uh, consideration of human as part of nature. Um, uh, the Seneca Nation is a model of connection to place, um, uh, and, and, and this project disrupted it. In terms of ecological uh, primacy, the dam project enhanced uh, was designed to enhance an industrial city, very much linked to a capitalist growth-driven economy, and there is a connection to planetary boundaries, uh, um, although the exact extent of that would require probably further study. Um, this is a, a, a part of a project to expand use of material and energy uh, in terms of true need alternatives that the Seneca proposed were rejected. Uh, local control was superseded. Um, fairness and justice, those issues I think are pretty clear. Um, and in terms of precaution and, and adaptabil uh, adaptability, this was a virtually uh, a project that was virtually irreversible once done. And if you're interested in learning more about this, I commend this um, this video to you. You can find that on uh, PBS online or at the Seneca Museum uh, store. Um, it's, a, it's a very good uh, fuller version of that story. So let me now <clears throat> update you on the five ecological law case studies that are now underway. So the first one, uh, so I, we presented these in a webinar on June 15th. Um, they're available um, uh, on YouTube if you want to get a, 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 a longer look at this. It's um, about an, a, you know, about 10 to 15 minutes for each of these um, uh, case studies. But let me give you some highlights here. The first, uh, dealing with restoring the river Ethiopia in the Delta state of uh, Nigeria. Th this is a river that's in the heart of the region of Nigeria that's been dominated by oil development since the 1950s. So, it illustrates uh, what's often called the resource curse, um, which is where uh, you know part of the world or a country is basically treated by the global economic system as a warehouse of something that's desired within the economic uh, system. In this case, it's oil. And what happens is that in this case, local communities and ecosystems have been transformed by oil development, but nearly all the gains go elsewhere or to elites within the country. Um, community cohesiveness and pre-oil connections to ecosystems like the Ethi River Ethiopia watershed have been disrupted. Poverty is very high. Um, there's a clear link to global trade and investment in fossil fuels. Um, in this case, it's pretty clear that the power and wealth associated with oil, the oil and gas sector overwhelms long-term term sustainability in the region. Uh, in terms of ecological limits, this case study really illustrates well links to climate change um, from our and uh, because of the dependency our our dependency on oil and at places like the delta the Niger Delta that support that um, and it's also interesting in that it puts front and center the emerging rights of nature movement and that the river Ethiop is likely to be the first African river to be granted legal personhood probably in this case by legislation. I think that's being drafted now. It's a kind of an exciting development here. Um, um, and there's been strong community engagement. There's been a strong effort with the River Ethiopia Trust Foundation um, to engage with communities and reestablish their connections to the river. It's very interesting to talk to the people in, involved there about the resistance to um, that kind of engagement, but gradually the, uh, it's being established. So it's, it, it, it is a, it, there are some exciting, exciting things going on um, in this particular case. So Irike um, Fidafe, Ngozi Unwigbe are based in Nigeria and are helping with that. Um, 
Dafe is the head of uh, the River Ethiopia Trust Foundation. Ngozi um, teaches at the University of Benin. Uh, and we also have uh, the Earth Law Center participating um, in that case study. And I want to just take a break here to, to let um, Dafe uh, explain some of the highlights here in his own words. So I'm going to stop sharing this and share something else for a second. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are listening from. Um, this is a, a case study with River Ethiopia, Eta State, Nigeria. I just want to thank you for this great opportunity. It is a timely, timely in the sense that uh, uh, we've been, you know, this business of uh, trying to restore and protect River Ethiopia in the last three decades. And this concept of ecological law coming at this time, where we are at the point of trying to give right of nature to revive you. It is a welcome development. This is the major cities and town which the river passes through in five local government councils area in Delta states. But the current economy of, of the state in Niger Delta area Dominated by oil and gas development since the discovery of major oil deposit in 1956, which generates considerable weight for the country. Nonetheless, Nigeria, and particularly the state in Niger Delta region, suffer from the resource cost phenomenon. In that, despite the richness in oil and gas and other hydrocarbon resources, poverty levels and environmental degradation continue rising on a daily basis. To a large extent, the cultural and the ways of the people has been converted from that of a river area to that of oil and gas uh, culture. Applying the ecological lens, based on what I have just said, we look at it from an ecocentric viewpoint to start with, that the current legal and institutional framework that applied to the variety of and its catchment is highly human-centered. And there need to be a drastic change to this. Looking at it from ecological premises, the current legal and institutional framework that applied to revive by detachment do not give primacy in the law to respecting and keeping human activity within the bounds of ecological limits. And to, to, to some extent, such primacy exists is not well implemented and enforced. Ecological justice. The current legal and national framework that apply to revive you and establishment is very weak on ecological law justice. In that it does not ensure intergenerational, intragenerational, and uh, interspecies fairness and justice. As a result, rate of poverty, lack of well being in human community in detachment are high, and the wealth extracted from oil development goes elsewhere. Harm to aquatic species is ongoing and other species in the, in the catchment face declining abundance and diversities. Abundance and diversities. In 2020, in January 2021, the key stakeholder, which, um, which covers both the indigenous people, the government, the business came together and declared the right of revival, which is now to be implemented through the State House of Assembly and the Federal House of Assembly before the end of this year. We hope with this in mind and applying the ecological law concept, we will overcome all difficulties, obstacles to ensuring that the virtue will stay for the present and future generations. Thank you.
so I I invite you to um, go to go to, to 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 YouTube to see more about that and the, and, and the other case studies. I'm not going to sh share a similar clip from the others, but let me give you some highlights. Um, in in terms of the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Ganyangahaga of Kanawaki near Montreal, this is this illustrates a clash of settler and indigenous worldviews. Um, and the legacy of the doc doctrine of discovery and colonialism more broadly. So the doctrine of discovery, as, as many of you probably know, is this idea of, of, of settler, mostly European uh, societies coming in and to places like Turtle Island or North America and saying, well, this is basically uninhabited or at least not in the way that they were used to in it. And there were no laws, so we'll impose our laws. And in fact, we now know there were uh, strong legal traditions um, and, and, and legal structures that were just not recognized as such. And so there's, a, there's just been a huge legacy. And this uh, construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway um, is, is just a vivid example of that. So, th so this is a seaway built. Um, uh, it started in the 1950s uh, that facilitates long distance travel and trade. It supports regional and global economic growth and in a capitalist context with where utilitarian desires and consumption are a key driver, uh, and it caused major displacement of people and disruption of ecosystems. Um, in this case, in terms of communi community engagement and fairness, you know, in the construction of the seaway, there was very little engagement. And this was the same with other um, uh, Ganyangahaga communities. Uh, Aquasazne is also on the St. Uh, Lawrence River upstream, and it, it suffered similar harms. Um, in, in this case study, uh, we, however, are, 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 will be stronger. The case study team will be strongly engaging with the community um, to discuss the seaway and how we go forward into the future. And it puts into context a, a really tough problem, which is how does ecological law deal with this kind of situation where you have irretrievable loss and harm? What is healing and reparations and remediation look like in that context? Uh, the phosphate mining in Anitopolis, and uh, let me just go back and recognize Professor Kirsten Anker and her two st uh, students, uh, Gabriel Dastus and Larissa Parker, who are leading this study. Um, the phosphate mining study in Anitopolis, uh, Brazil, uh, is about uh, a proposed phosphate mine that so far has been stopped, but sort of, but could be restarted. Uh, um, in a hilly agricultural region of the Atlantic Forest in Santa Catarina State in Brazil. Um, this is being led by um, Professor Cristiane Derani and um, her student, uh, Gabriela Pinera and, and other students. So this is a story of a local community pitted against wealthy, powerful interests. It's an ag-dependent community and some of the best land um, around the community was expropriated for use for this uh, phosphate mine and processing uh, 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 um, uh, installation. The parent company of this phosphate mine is, is now based in Miami, um, and the phosphate products uh, would be designed for global trade, for the global fertilizer trade. So there's a legacy of colonialism here and also a strong link to global trade and investment. And there's also a, law, a strong and interesting link to planetary boundaries and that researchers say that the planetary boundary for additions of phosphorus to ecosystems has been crossed already. Uh, phosphorus additions to ecosystems threatened by adversity uh, and farming enhanced with phosphorus fertilizers is linked to climate change and so on. Uh, the case study on uh, considering ecological law in the context of marine biodiversity on the high seas is being led um, by uh, Professor Sarah Ryder of the Vermont Law School. And this contextualizes ecological issues in the oceans. And she's considering um, how ecological law principles uh, relate or would change a consideration of two marine protected areas, at least in her, in her, those are the focus of the work she's presented so far. One is in the US, um, uh, in the economic uh, economic zone of the U.S. and one is at the bottom of the ocean in an area beyond national jurisdiction, ABNJ. So this case study involves a deep dive into the history, evolution, function, and guiding principles of marine protected areas. Um, we can see from what she's done so far that the focus of the high seas treaties and 
the, the, the parts that are being negotiated now is it's really to maintain equitable access to fisheries and marine sources for for economic purposes primarily with routine protected areas sort of being part of the bigger picture. Um, so a key challenge here is that fishing uh, and mining exploitation of marine genetic and mineral resources, um, the pressure to do that is strong. There's considerable resistance to stays of exploration claims and exploitation while the situation gets mapped out uh, from a systemic point of view that takes into account uh, climate change, biodiversity, and so on. So early conclusions that uh, uh, Professor Ryder is making is that ecological law is overall poorly reflected in both current practice and the tr treaty negotiations underway for marine, diverse, marine biodiversity on the high seas, which of course is, is, is a key global commons. And um, Professor uh, Pamela Visland and her student uh, Heidi Gunther are working on a case study on wild animal law in Vermont, illustrated by the strange but true saga of Pete the Moose. And those of you from Vermont who are listening in probably know this story, uh, a story about a, a moose who um, became domesticated more or less, uh, was, was, was orphaned or, or think otherwise um, in need of some care, and then uh, a well-meaning Vermonter got attached to him. Uh, he was put into a private hunting reserve. There were then conflicts that arose in terms of uh, how he should be treated in terms of the state's program to control um, a, a tick infestation uh, affecting moose and other wildlife. Um, and then he ended up dying of a, of a foot disease um, due to be, probably due to eating too much human food from the crowds of people who went to see him. Um, so it's quite a, a, a sad story, and it, it just puts into sharp relief some some really interesting questions about the human earth relationship and um, and how we relate to animals, uh, non human animals. Um, and, and and one of the things that uh, Professor Vesland shows here is how uh, property regimes dictate how the law considers human relationships to wild animals like moose or a special animal like Pete the Moose, whether it's as a wild animal, whether it's as a pet, whether it's as common property um, or so on. Um, and I think this case study also has some broader lessons about the pervasiveness and implications of property regimes. Um, animals are but one example of what the law typically treats as public, common or private property of humans. And what are the broad implications of different approaches, approaches that would be more consistent with principles of ecological law? I want to quickly just note that um, Carlos Spirit and I have, have just had an article um, looking at uh, the Canada-U.S.-Mexico agreement or U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. It has two names in English because apparently they couldn't agree on one. NAFTA 2.0 through the lens of ecological law. So we've just had this article accepted by the Vermont Law Review. Um, and we've just, we've concluded that not surprisingly, this agreement is profoundly anthropocentric. It takes a market oriented and utilitarian view of the human earth relationship. Um, it gives primacy to economic growth and competitivity, not ecological limits like planetary boundaries. It com pretty much completely ignores the climate crisis. And, and maintain strong protection of sovereignty and private property. It kind of contains a kind of upside down precautionary principle in that it institutionalizes caution against environmental and other regulations from being too strong vis-a-vis -vis trade and competitivity. So these are just, you know, the, the sort of boilerplate kind of uh, least trade restrictive rules about um, various kinds of environmental and other regulations that are present in most trade agreements. And then this agreement has a special chapter 28 is on good uh, regulatory practice, which is really about offering uh, business interests opportunities to throw wrenches in the processes for adopting regulations. Um, and those are rules that will be, uh, they're mandatory and they can be enforceable through state, uh, in other words, country to country enforcement. And this agreement maintains weak environmental measures. The one Good thing about it, perhaps, is that it scales back investor state dispute uh, 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 systems uh, that were present in, for example, Chapter 11 of NAFTA. 
in terms of ecological justice, it focuses on satisfying growing utilitarian desires, not real needs at the expense of non-human nature and future generations of all life. Um, and it ignores wealth and income um, disparities. Um, so there are a number of emerging lessons here. There are some concrete examples in diverse contexts. I hope that's be become clear from a look at, at these examples I've given today. Uh, about how, how legal regimes fail to include principles of ecological law, imposing enormous challenges and barriers to a transition to ecological law. Economic growth, state sovereignty, private property interests and wealth accumulation, not uh, ecological limits have primacy. Uh, dominant legal systems are profoundly um, anthropocentric. International regimes for protecting parts of Earth ecosystems like marine protected areas may have overarching goals of maintaining access to and use of ecosystems generally to support growth and wealth accumulation. Um, legal regimes, including trade and investment law, often perpetuate colonial legacies of land and resource grabbing and remote provisioning. There are enduring harms from major disruptions of local ecosystems and communities that pose a, a very big justice challenge for ecological law. And finally, rights of nature and strong limitation of the Paris Climate Accord may lead in the direction of ecological law in a transitional period. We're going to be publishing the results of these studies in a book that should be coming out in 2022, um, basically describing the case studies, doing some comparative analysis, and then conclusions and recommendations for future research. Um, as part of these case studies, or along with them, we have an upcoming workshop. We'll certainly make this available to people at um, the Vermont Law School and elsewhere. Um, this will be a three-part workshop, uh, hopefully with, with CLE credit, um, an inter introduction to ecological law case studies, presentation of these five case studies, and then a working session with participants to develop ideas for additional case studies. So this really will be a hands-on um, workshop. And you know, I would say you don't have to have a particular idea. You can come and listen to other ideas and maybe generate some as part of that workshop. And then we have um, various kinds of outreach, including a new ecological law blog um, on the L4E website. And uh, you know, a lot kind of a focus effort on building the network along with the Ecological Law and Governance Association and other uh, ELGA research centers uh, to build a global network advancing eco ecological law. So thank you very much. This last slide just gives you just a, a quick glimpse of some of the emerging work that's coming out in the area of ecological law. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor. Um, we do have a few minutes for our audience to ask questions and just to remind you how to do that. If you're watching on the website live stream, click on the icon at the bottom of the video to bring up the chat box where you can log in and add your question. Or if you're watching on Facebook live stream, add your question to the comment box below and we'll get through as many as we can with the time that we have. Our first question is, do you anticipate a shift from traditional environmental law to ecological law principles in the next 10 years? What are the indicators? Well, that that that, that is something I, I try to pay attention to. And I alluded uh, briefly to the rights of nature movement. Um, and I'm particularly interested in seeing what happens with some of the success or initial success stories there. The one that I refer to most is the the, the Fanganui River um, settlement and legislation that implements meant it in, in, in New Zealand. So that settlement resolved over a hundred years of disputes, treaty-based disputes, you know, in a colonial setting um, where the the Whanganui Iwi, the indigenous uh, people had you know, it's really been overridden. Their notion of kinship and relationship to the river had been overridden by a more um, human separated from nature uh, approach that's typical in dominant legal systems and European law and settler based societies like New Zealand, Canada, United States, and so on. So what this uh, settlement does is it gives 
personhood to the river. It creates a guardianship uh, uh, with representatives from both the government and from the Maori communities. Um, and it puts some key worldview concepts uh, from the Maori front and center in future just decision making about the river, no matter who's making those decisions. So either whether it's not Maori or whether it's you know, the more traditional water districts that are using the water for economic interests, farming and so on. Um, when they make decisions, the first thing they have to pass through that the most important uh, consideration has to be given to these uh, Maori principles like we are the river, the river is us. And those are spelled out in the settlement and the agreement. So that's happening in other parts of the world in, in Quebec and, and Canada. Um, earlier this year, the Magpie River was declared, uh, uh, rights of the Magpie River was declared by an Inuit community and in a local community in Northern Quebec to try to protect that river from hydroelectric development that would be very disruptive of um, indigenous uses. Um, Ecuador has installed this in their in, in their in their constitution. There are many examples around the world. So this is some place uh, that uh, this is an area that resonates with the ecological law, where you really have movement on the ground. Um, will that be diluted? Uh, you know, diluted as uh, as I mentioned, is a fear that those of us working in this field um, uh, are are concerned about. Um, that remains to be seen. It certainly happened in some places that have recognized a human right to a healthy environment. I think of Pennsylvania, which included that in their state constitution and the state, the Supreme Court eventually said, well, this really is this, you know, there's, there has to be balanced against other rights and it really doesn't change much. So um, rights of nature is one. And then the second thing I point to is the Paris Accord. Uh, now, if you're reading up on this, you know that the commitments that countries have made are not sufficient uh, to stay uh, to, to, to stay within a safe boundary. Um, but there is an opportunity to tighten those limits every five years. And so I think it's important to keep an eye on what's happening there and whether uh, countries will get more serious over time as you know, we're learning with wildfires, uh, extreme heat and so on, uh, uh, extreme weather, uh, that this is real uh, awareness, hopefully it's growing. And so the impetus to tighten those uh, commitments uh, may arise. But of course, it, it's a huge challenge given um, our current um, economic system and the focus on growth and uh, capital accumulation and wealth accumulation. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question for you is, ecological law appears to lend itself to indigenous leadership. Are you seeing an emphasis in ecological law on elevating indigenous people's voices? I think it's a huge opportunity. So the, the, the Fanganui River example, um, again, illustrates that. Um, and I'll just say a little more. There are, we, we have seen an indigenous role with uh, the recognition of rights for the Magpie River. There are other efforts underway, um, potentially in Canada, in the United States, uh, the, the Yurok tribes in, 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 uh, in the West uh, on the Klamath River are, are uh, asserting rights of nature for the, for the Klamath. Um, their tribes in, in, the, in the Midwest, uh, Anishinaabe, I think, or Ojibwe are asserting rights for wild rice, um, which is a traditional, uh, uh, you, you know, which is a, a big part of their culture requires, you know, has ecosystem needs. There's a kinship relationship there. Um, so it is, you know, for me, it, it, it's a huge antidote in a way, what we're hearing and learning from indigenous communities now, sort of a re-empowerment that's showing that a lot of uh, you know, the hubris and arrogance of the doctrine of discovery, the, the idea that there was no valid set of law was was just extremely wrongheaded um, and is now pushing us, pu pushing us off a cliff. So I do think um, indigenous worldviews, uh, practices, knowledge, uh, legal traditions are an important source for um, for ecological law going forward. Okay. 
Well, I see that we are uh, at five of one, which is typically when we need to wrap up in order to let folks get to their one o'clock class. So thank you again, Jeff, for your presentation. And thank you so much to our viewers for joining us today. Our final Hot Topics talk of the summer will be this Thursday, August 5th at noon. And we hope you can join us then. Thanks, everyone.